Hello and welcome to Innovation Bites, the podcast where we take a snapshot of the tastiest and most exciting parts of the Australian innovation ecosystem. My name is Gavin Heaton and Innovation Bites is brought to you by Disruptors Co, recorded at Quantum Terminal on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Hello, and my name is Lenore Johnston, and this week we will be speaking with Hannah McGinn, founder and director of Cut Agency, a creative wholesale distribution agency. She's currently participating in the City of Sydney's Business Innovation Program. We'll also be chatting to Anthony J. James, business influencer and CEO at Trinity Consulting Services. But first, let's take a look at what's making headlines this week. New South Wales Chief Data Scientist Dr Ian Opperman has announced that the New South Wales Government Guide for AI is being refreshed amid a widespread push for the technology across government. Australian organisations are being urged to tighten the use of artificial intelligence with the application of ethics principles ahead of changes to regulations and standards. The CSIRO's National Artificial Intelligence Centre on Thursday launched a how-to guide for bridging ethics principles and practice after worrying signs businesses were still coming to grips with the basics of responsible use. CSIRO's Board of Directors have appointed molecular and cellular biologist Professor Doug Hilton to be the next Chief Executive of CSIRO. He is set to replace their longest serving leader, Dr. Larry Marshall, who will finish up at the end of this month. Macquarie Uni spin out Hygene Renewables, a green hydrogen startup, has raised $6 million to reduce the reliance on fossil fuels. This included $2 million from the federal government's Green Bank. The renewable hydrogen tech turns biomass waste into green molecules or carbon negative gas. That's all for the headlines this week. We will now be crossing to Hannah McGinn from Cut Agency, followed by Anthony J. James, CEO and LinkedIn business influencer. And remember, links to all the headline stories can be found in the show notes. Today, we are joined by Hannah McGinn. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So could you tell us a little bit about Hannah McGinn? What do you do? Yeah, what do I do? So I own a company called Conscious Universal Traders, also known as Cut. Um, We're quite a complex company. We're figuring out as we're doing this course. Um, But we are mainly a wholesale distribution agency. Um, But then we also, about a year and a half ago, opened a bricks and mortar store, which is now Cut Store, um, which is in Surrey Hills, um, which is a mecca for all of the newest and latest international and local fashion brands, accessories, homewares, and lifestyle. And how did you get into that? Yeah, okay. So how far back do you want me to go? What's the story? What what was that energy? What was the spark that got you into it? Sure. So school, high school, I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. Um, And I was going through a bit of a rebellious time, I think, during school. was always that um, student that I was – detentions every day but still did well you know driven but like I have an issue with authority I would say um Don't we all. but I think the one thing that really you know drove me and gave me drive was that I wanted to be independent so finished school didn't want to go to uni didn't want to do any of that um and I got a job very at 18 out of school my first full-time job working for a big international distributor that was importing a big um, US brands. Um, and I worked my way up quite quickly from a young age. 2020, I got offered a job from one of the brands that were opening a New York office. And I was like, yeah. Fabulous. I moved to New York. <laughs> the cocky Hannah that was the 20-year-old never had lived out of home. Um, as my mum said, I'd never been cold and I'd never been poor. So she loved that for me. Um, I had to wait till I was 21 to actually move to New York because I wasn't legally allowed to go to trade shows and all of the things that are within the industry. Um, so, yeah, moved to New York when I was 21 and was there for about three years um, doing wholesale sales, fashion premium denim learning the ropes. stuff, learning the ropes, still rebelling and not really realising how much of an incredible opportunity that was, but also like had to get over myself very, very quickly. And it was the best thing that I could have ever done. Um, so New York, moved home, worked for a few different fashion brands here, um, 
did okay, like did well in the job but wasn't loving it. Um, and then fast forward a few years, my through a friend of a friend um, had put me in touch with someone that they'd started working with. So family friend owned a big PR agency and um, they just started taking on a new client who was in the premium denim game. Mm. That's what I'd already, always been in. Um, met them, awesome, awesome couple from Queensland that are like some of the biggest cotton um, manufacturers and farmers. Um, and they took a little punt on me, I guess. So teamed up with them and we created Cut Showroom, which was what we were then, mm -hmm. um, and started a yeah, distribution agency with their brand and then started importing a few other brands. And then fast forward a few years, we they started to focus more on their cotton venture, which they're doing incredible things now. Um, and I took on Cut on my own. So I was wow. Like, uh, incredible. Yeah, like seven years ago. Time flies. Yeah. <laughs> Time does fly. <laughs> I was going to say that. So it was, yeah, something like Quite that. the journey. Quite the journey. <laughs> so that's who we are, what we do. And, yeah, now we have the agency, which is about 90% of the business. And now we're really trying to build the store with the e-com and the bricks and mortar. Of course. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So in terms of any trends, is there anything that you've been noticing and responding to lately? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to bore you guys with like fashion trends because like who cares, <laughs> like the colours of the season and everything else. That's also not what I'm interested in. I'm in an industry that, you know, has its name, but I'm in a business to make money <laughs> and it doesn't matter what I'm doing. So it's not about the trends. I would say more so as an industry, what I'm really noticing is how big sustainability is. Um, like way back when, when we first started Cut, when it was still Cut Show and before we did the whole rebrand and everything, um, we were always focused on brands that had an ethical and sustainable factor. Mm -hmm. And back then, it, that wasn't a trendy thing to do. Mm -hmm. That was um, a lot more niche, I would say. And now, fast forward, every single brand is pushing the sustainability mm. clause. Right. Some of them are great. Some of them are hiding behind others. Greenwashing. Greenwashing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's just a major trend. And, you know, Conscious is our branding, Conscious Universal Traders. Um, but, yeah, it's it's hard now to kind of differentiate ourselves with what we're doing and the brands that we're standing by mm -hmm. and just making sure that we're aligned with each other's values and everything else. So. Oh, yeah. So tell me a bit, a little bit about that. So tell me how yeah. that's rolling out and changing the way that you approach business. In terms of values? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we did a big um, values exercise as a team at the end of last year when we kind of redid our whole strategy for the following year and everything else. Um, and then we did a brand deck that you gave me the exercise <laughs> for the other day, Gavin, um, which was amazing. So as a business and like doing this course with you guys and the Trying to think what we're going to innovate and how we're going to potentially pivot or what we're going to do with the store is we really like values is a huge part of the team mm -hmm. and me and the business and what we've always been about we want to make sure that we're aligning with brands and partners that are aligned with our values um more than ever and we're trying to think of ways in how we can really sell from values as well to watch this space we have a few ideas in yeah. the mix but yeah values driven has become a huge huge topic in our office and we're all working on quite a few of those at the moment that must be exciting yeah. as well yeah it's really exciting and it really brings the team together as well and it makes us all feel aligned knowing the vision that we're you know the direction that we're going in the long-term vision um it's been really good. Is there anything that you can share with us in terms of what's next or is it sort of? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to still figure that out. But on the agency side, it's been a pretty big week. We've actually just signed with three new brands. Um, three. Which, yeah. <laughs> Add that to the workload. But, yeah, like in the last year or so, you know, business has been tough and with the economy and with – everything that's happening internationally, we had a few suppliers fall over. And for us, like that's an instant loss of revenue. Um, and that's what made us be like, okay, who do we want to align with? Who do we want to work with? Like 
business is hard enough. I don't want to work with dickheads anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've got big things happening in terms of new brands coming on board, which is really, really exciting. Um, and then, yeah, we're looking at what we're going to do with the retail space. So we have this beautiful, beautiful shop from in Surrey Hills on Crown Street, opposite Fishbowl. It's green and pink and gold and everything fabulous, but we just don't have the awareness for the store yet. So we're innovating what we're going to do with it. And it's very much around values and how we can also support other small businesses um, and really build a community with other like-minded businesses, brands, um, and ultimately support, you know, the Surrey Hills community, but communities outside of that as well. So, beautiful. yeah, watch Fantastic. this space. We haven't exactly mapped it out yet, but we have ideas. Getting close. We're getting close. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So whereabouts can we find you online? Then? Mm -hmm. So we've got our direct-to-consumer website, cutstore.com.au. Um, and you can find us on Instagram. You can shop Instagram. You've got Facebook. We've got TikTok. Also watch this space. We've just hired a TikTok strategist and we are really going to increase what we're doing on social media. Um, I'm going to get behind the camera more. So this is a great intro for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, lots of socials. More to come. Cutstore.com. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Hannah. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks for sharing all of your insights. It's been really great. No worries. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Hi, AJ. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're more than welcome. Great to be here with you. I was hoping that you would be able to tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Uh, what do I do? That's a bit, it is a very good question. <laughs> um, I'm the CEO of a uh, consultancy called Trinity Consulting. Um, we look at a number of different areas, but really our space is in uh, finding, finding solutions to clients' business problems, really looking at the application of technology and creativity. Uh, and I like to think that, that where those two meet is where the magic happens or the innovation actually happens. Um, in building, I've sort of been building the consultancy now for about the last eight to nine years. Uh, I also have a little bit of a following on on LinkedIn as well globally uh, that helps sort of generate and lead the business and our our, our growth uh, with clients around the world. And a little bit of a, a little bit of a sideline there. It's not really much, of a, not a little sideline at all. You know, how how many followers do you have on LinkedIn? Uh, so approaching four million at the moment. So um, yeah, I, I believe I believe from the numbers out of the nine hundred odd million uh, users on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm sitting at about number fifteen in the world as mo most followed. So it's it's funny when you when you see the list and. Number one, Bill Gates. Number two, Richard Branson. And you you get down to number 15 and there's this, you know, Australian that nobody's ever really heard of before. So it, it's quite it's quite a nice list to be on. But, you know, that's, that's you know, I've got a, a big belief that if you've got that following, um, you know, you've got people looking at your content and you're getting the engagement. And, you know, I very much stick to my knitting. So if you've got listeners that follow me on LinkedIn, they'll know I'm known for, you know, innovation, technology and creative business solutions or solutions that meet business problems that they never knew had solutions to. Growing your following, was it a planned thing? And if it was, how long did it take? So I was a very early adopter of the platform. Uh, so I think I'm just past my 18th or 19th year on on the platform um so you know early adopter signed up not too many people out there we all connected with each other so i've actually got some very big names in my network who i connected with in the early days who are also early adopters but we weren't there really looking for jobs or I didn't need a job at the time I was at IBM. So I thought, well, this is nice. I'm signed up and I sort of let it be. 
Um, fast forward in my career when I joined Agency World and, you know, sort of learned a lot about building a brand, not only brands for clients, but a personal brand. I sort of thought, actually, this could be a good platform to do that on. LinkedIn was changing uh, quite a bit. Uh, it wasn't just about people posting their CVs and their experience, but posting out the projects they were working on and those sorts of things. Where it really took off for me was uh, 2016 when LinkedIn went out to search for um, some global thought leaders. And I thought, well, why not try and be one of those? I've got enough experience in the industry. Uh, I've had, you know, 20 odd years in corporate enterprise, digital technology. I'm now in the you know agency world, um, time to build my own brand. So I started really just with the thought leadership and publishing an article here and there and a few posts here and there. And, and, and it sort of snowballed. And, you know, I was um, recognized by LinkedIn as the most uh, the, the, the most influential agency voice across Asia Pacific, one of three global um, uh, awards that they gave out that year. Subsequently, 2018, I was given a LinkedIn Power Profile. Uh, don't have any props. It's over on the shelf. But I've, got, <laughs> I've, still, I've still got the trophy to prove it. Um, and, and then I got a top uh, Australian top voice and I think made the front cover as, of, of B&T as the, the most... Um, you know, influential marketing and advertising executive in in Australia. So it sort of started from there. Uh, there's no secret sauce. There's no magic bullet. It's all about <laughs> consistency. And Gavin knows this. Gavin knows this very well because it's my big mantra. If you want to build a following like that, if you want to uh, build a presence, it has nothing to do with vanity metrics or any of that rubbish that people like to talk about. Uh, if you want to build that following, if you want to build your personal brand and you want to be known out there, it's about the three C's, consistency, consistency, consistency. You could have joined in, Mr. Heaton. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, there, there, there is no easy way about it. It is all about consistency. It's about showing up. It's about engaging consistently with your followers and your audience. Um, you know, sharing your thought leadership, sharing your views, engaging in that content uh, and, and not doing that, you know, on a Tuesday at 9 a.m. and a Thursday at 4 p.m. because some, you know, um, trainer or uh, advisor said that's what you've got to do to build your presence. So, um, it, it, look, it's, it's, it's a constant journey. It's not one you can actually stop either. Uh, because engagement does typically start to fall away pretty quickly. Um, bit of a long answer to your question. No, it's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And what 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 does a day like, look like for you, for you if you've got 4 million followers? What does that look like? Uh, the, the one thing is not to look at your notifications too often during the day. Uh, I, think you asked, I think you asked me just before we started, so we're now at uh, 5,684 notifications i think that's an increase in the last six minutes of about what four five three hundred right <laughs> um so look I, I actually do do my best especially with messages that get sent to me directly and i get on a on a good day a good day i mean i don't get too many messages about 80 to 100 messages on a heavy day it can be three to four thousand um but i do do my best to get through most of them, mainly because I feel if it's my audience and they're reaching out, um, then you know, there could be that nugget in there. There could be that lead. There could be that piece of gold. Um, a lot of the time, their message is just like, hi, um, and my engagement is swipe left, more delete. Um, but because I don't have time for that, just, you know, responding to somebody who wants to say hi. Uh, but you know, it, it's also that constant balance between uh, the creation of content and that can, for, that can form lots of different, um, it can take lots of different forms, like it can be that long-form post, that long-form article or a short post or a poll or, you know, curating a piece of interesting tech or an interesting innovation that I've never seen before. 
uh, and it goes through a couple of filters very quickly in my head because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and, and then there's the longer form of creating that content. So I really balance off that curation and that creation in, in, in what I put into the feed. Uh, but again, it's all about the consistency. Numbers I've read, you know, 2 million posts a day going into the feed. If you're not getting at least a couple into the feed during the day, you're not getting seen. And if you're only putting one or two a week with 2 million a day going in, um, it's even harder to get seen. That's one of the challenges, right? Because a lot of people think that they're putting, uh, if they're publishing something into LinkedIn, that they think they're reaching their audience. But really, it's down to the algorithm. It, look, I... Uh, I, you know what, Gavin, honestly, I can't talk about the algorithm. I don't know the algorithm. I think, you know, uh, quite frankly, anybody who starts talking about the algorithm and the way it works, I don't really read much past that first the algorithm. Of, I've cracked the algorithm. Uh, that's a that's a quick delete post or, you know, re remove or move, swipe up to, to get rid of. Um you know, it, it's, it's their algorithm. It's LinkedIn's algorithm. It's changing all the time. Um, to me, it's about sticking to your knitting, sticking to what you know, um, you know, and I've, I've learned over the years that I can also branch out a little bit. So I can move into a lot of different industries because one, they have business problems, but with a little, with the application of some creative thinking, and technology, there are often solutions that, you know, span industries. So um, you're, you're right. I mean, just putting something out there in the feed, uh, is it the right time at the right place for the right person to read and engage with that content? That's, that's the tough bit. And that's where I think consistency really helps in, you know, getting that, that, that message across. And I think it's the big issue that brands have as well. You know, they, they think, well, I'm a big brand or maybe I'm a startup, but if I get my message out there, then all the people I want to reach will read it. Well, that's not the case because you put your post in and by the end of the day, there's another 2 million posts on top of that feed or if that's the, the number, um, it's pretty easy to get lost. And you don't need massive follow. You don't need a massive following to get that across. It's really more about the consistency. That's interesting. So I know that you said that you don't follow, you know, maybe what the algorithm wants or anything like that, but are there any particular trends that you've noticed over this year, for example, the last 12 months? Yeah, I think that, let's just be clear though. The reason I don't, I, I don't try and work the algorithm out because it's always changing, mm -hmm. you know? So, so one of the things uh, that I've noticed Maybe, maybe it's not the way the algorithm works, but one of the things that I've noticed is, for instance, that at certain times, and I'm not talking times of the day or days of the week or months of the year, but at certain times, um, it looks like certain types of content are favoured over other types of content. What I mean by that, some some days you may put up a, a video and 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 you find that video content is really trending heavily like it's getting lots of engagement lots of comments um but you may put that up the next week or the next month and act, it, it doesn't get the same level of engagement that maybe a photo or an image gets so all of a sudden images are trending or documents are trending or polls are trending there was a period when polls first came out that you know the platform wanted you to try polls and so they were getting massive engagement with polls um now useful if you're using that to write papers or doc you know articles or whatever um so again it's all about the consistency and trying different things and experimenting and mixing the content up that to me would be the biggest if you like trend that changes constantly um, through through what I see at least, and I can only speak from the content that I publish and that I put out there. That's interesting. And do you think there's, do you think the LinkedIn is the place that people should be or brands should be? Is this is it that kind of space now? Is it, or, or are we still looking somewhere else? No, I, look, I, I'm 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 maybe uh, 
not exactly the best person to ask that question because I don't use any other social media channels. I don't <laughs> have time um, to, to uh, you yeah, know, and you know, Gav, I've never been on Facebook, so I don't know <laughs> some of these other platforms. But I do think, I do think LinkedIn is the big untapped potential for brands. And the reason, that, you know, the reason I make that statement or I come from that position is I look at some of these other platforms, right? And I look at for brands where their buyers are, where the decision makers are. Now, you know, if, if you're a startup looking for venture capital or you're a manufacturing and construction firm selling a major piece of um, equipment, um, I would hesitate to guess. Now, I'm not on TikTok. I've never done a dance there or anything like that. But I'd hesitate to guess that, you know, this. let's say it's a piece of construction equipment, um, you know, your end buyers are possibly not using TikTok or Instagram to make major investment decisions for their business, um, potentially using, you know, Facebook to decide, you know, to, to follow their, their kids and their, their grandkids and their family, using Instagram to, you know, look at where they're going to eat dinner next week when they travel to Thailand. Um, I don't know what they use TikTok for, but that's a different story. But I do think those decision makers are on a platform like LinkedIn to do business. Mm -hmm. So without a doubt, I still think it's the big untapped uh, potential for brands. It's about how you use the platform in a way rather than to push your message out and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. Use it in a way that says, actually, this is a really interesting organisation. They've got some really interesting things to say. Who are they? What are they? Who do I connect to within that organisation? What they're doing really helps a business problem I've got. It's worth contacting them. So for that reason, I, I believe it is the big untapped potential and where all brands should be actually looking. A great insight into how you use digital media uh, in you know the current age because a lot of brands, a lot of businesses are out there trying to figure this out right now and mm -hmm. they, they do struggle. They often say, which one of these platforms should we be on? And often LinkedIn is last on their list. As sometimes happens with podcasts, we latch onto a topic and it takes us into unexpected places. This is the case with our conversation with Anthony James. So we thought we'd break this topic in two and return to it next week. At Disruptors Co, we believe in innovating on purpose. This includes taking feedback and making deliberate choices and improvements. So while we are in the early stages of this podcast, we've had feedback from our listeners asking for more insights and analysis. So let's run a Disruptors lens over what we've heard. When a new disruptive technology emerges, we look for five themes. One, the rise of experts. Two, organizational transformation. Three, revising social and legal norms. Four, changes to concepts of identity and community. And five, pressure on educators. We are seeing all five of these playing out right now. Let's have a look. First of all, we need someone to guide us through new technology to provide insights. And as these new voices emerge, they collide with the established experts and it causes friction. This is why AI is so hot right now. Smoke meets fire. New technology ushers in social, cultural and political change. So the new organizations that need to emerge from this to deal with the challenges haven't yet started to build their coalitions and gain momentum, but they are coming and we're seeing it starting to happen right now. We've also seen that the New South Wales government is moving fast to address ethical and legal challenges, but can governments move fast enough at the pace of technology and of change? We will see. And as concepts of identity and community are transformed, new language emerges. We are hit with new waves of transformation over and over again. Right now, this is perhaps more profound because we are adding metaverse identity into the mix. We are adding in privacy concerns and legislation. And we're seeing things like deep fakes hitting our social channels. We're going to have a rough but exciting time ahead of us. That's for sure. Finally, educators are coming under pressure to explain this new and emerging world. We are seeing this, but again, these systems take time to catch up. 
we can expect to see a lot more independent thought leadership emerging in this space. So is AI a disruptive technology? Absolutely it is. Interestingly, a prescription to these challenging symptoms have also emerged. As Hannah McGinn from Cutstore has explored, doubling down on human, supplier and customer values is going to be a key driver of differentiation in the marketplace. And in the world of AI, I have a feeling that it's one way of drawing a line in the sand of the machine learning desert. And then, as Anthony J. James suggests, we do need to live and work in the world where our customers are. We need to know where our decision makers are and how to reach them. And when you are sending out only one signal in a world of two million signals a day, you'll be needing your values to shine through. Next week, we will return with Anthony James and we'll talk megaphones versus magnets. And there'll be more of the tasty innovation treats from the Australian innovation ecosystem. Have a disruptive week. Mm -hmm.